You guys see Instagram. Great. Cool. Yeah. So, all right, let's do it. Oh my gosh. Anyway, so now this first question on Instagram, I don't understand because it's not really English. So, fui this diagnosticada con cancer mama. 39 años me ajude. And I don't understand that, so I'm sorry. I know you, uh, your mother's 39, she has cancer, but I don't know what to say about that. I'm sorry. Um, anyway, so... Uh, so, anyway, here's another question. What do you think about Floridex to increase iron or hemoglobin levels? Okay, so Floridex is good. Floridex is a liquid form of iron, and it's better than the pills. The pills really seem to constipate people, and the the liquid doesn't. And I've seen a lot of people raise their iron levels uh, nicely with Floridex. And Floridex is actually good. It's been around for years and years and years. We used to use it 22 years ago. But the thing is, when you have cancer, the problem with iron, if you just, if you just take iron and you don't really work on... Wait. If you just take iron... Um, it can easily go to the to the tumor and cause the tumor to grow. So that's the problem with iron, um, and that's why in with people that have cancer, we always see a high ferritin and a low iron. A ferritin is the storage form of iron. You know, put this here. Yeah. Anyway, ferritin is the storage form of iron, so it goes high. It's storing a lot of it. The body's storing the iron because it doesn't want the cancer to get it and grow. So it kind of keeps it there. I mean, that's, that's my anthropomorphic, my anthropomorphizing the way the body works, which is ridiculous. But anyway, so who, who knows why anything ever happens, but it happens. Um, but the point is we know ferritin goes high and iron goes low. And in fact, this is one of the, the really important ratios to always look at if you have cancer is the ferritin to iron ratio. But taking Floridex is going to be good. I mean, you're going to get higher levels. You're going to get higher iron levels, which is good. But you also might be feeding the cancer. So the problem is, how do you, you know, you got to get your uh, your iron, you've got to keep your iron adequate because iron is not only necessary for um, uh, producing hemoglobin, which carries oxygen to all your cells. That's not only important for that, but it's involved in like 200, uh, uh, 200 other reactions in the body. So extremely important. Okay. So... Extremely important. And, uh, uh, and your question was that. Okay, and the reason Floridex is good is because Floridex actually is in a plant form, right? So it's in a bioavailable form. And remember, anytime you can get your nutrient needs met by whole foods, of course that's a better way. Because your body was designed to absorb it in that way. All right? So, when uh, when you take a pill, when you take an isolated nutrient that's been processed, of course you're not going to get anywhere near the benefit of it, right? So uh, yeah. Thank you, Terry. That's beautiful. Thank you. Um, now here's a question: Can necrotic tissue be restored and nerves restored? If it is mild ischemic tissue. Okay, so for those of you who don't know what the word ischemic means, it means just uh, when there's a lack of blood flow. And if there's a lack of blood flow, that means there's a lack of oxygen. So it's basically low oxygen. This is what happens in a heart attack. This is what happens in what we call ischemic or dry strokes. Uh, this can happen to kidneys. It can happen to the bowel or anything. Wherever the blood vessel, wherever the artery is blocked in any way, and there's not adequate amount of blood going there, which carries um, oxygen, then that's called ischemia. And ischemia will cause the tissues to die. Now the word necrotic in this question here is, can necrotic tissue be restored and nerves restored? Um, ne if it's actually necrotic, in other words, it's dead, then no. However, there's a phenomenon that exists that is uh, 
I guess it was discovered with uh, heart attacks, you know, and with a heart attack, someone it's called, um, you get, because the coronary arteries are the small arteries that feed the heart. Okay, so they, they get spasm off, usually that's the main cause, right? It's not usually block, blocked. There's a blockage, but then it spasms. But anyway, you spasm it off or you block it off in whatever, whatever way, the blood doesn't go to that part of the heart, the heart muscle, and so that heart muscle um, will die. Without oxygen, it dies. Okay, because oxygen is necessary to make energy and to keep it alive. And, you know, we, we, we talk about mitochondria all the time and its relationship to, uh, to cancer and all that. But uh, it's also mitochondria's relationship to every aspect of um, a cell's life. Um, so anyway, so... Um, The term that was developed with with heart attacks that works really that's going to help answer this question is that <clears throat> the artery goes into the muscle, right? And let's say it's blocked off, so there's that part there right at the end is not getting any oxygen. So there's a small part in there not getting any oxygen. It will die. It will die. Now all around it there are cells all around it that have other collateral flow in other words they got they have blood flow from other smaller vessels and larger vessels and and, and things like that all around so if actually that there's only a small part that actually dies but the part around it is now not getting the benefit of that central one that just blocked off and so it's kind of like not quite getting enough and so you get symptoms from that and pain from that. Anyway, they came up with the term stunned myocardium. Myo meaning muscle, cardium is heart, so myocardium. So stunned heart muscle. It's called stunned heart muscle. Um, we also get the same thing with stroke, right? So now, um, uh, and in fact, just, just as you know, there was a brilliant doctor in San Diego who spent, I don't know how many millions of dollars protecting his license uh, because guess what he was doing? Helping people. And he wasn't hurting them. Okay, what he was using was he was using hyperbaric oxygen for people that had strokes. Okay, and what he was able to find is that after five years, you had the stroke up to five years ago, you could restore 85% of the deficit. And what do I mean by deficit? When you get a stroke, for example, it's in, let's say, the motor part of your brain. And so you, the right, your right, for example, your right arm and right leg aren't, aren't moving at all, right? Now, if you regain 85% of that function, now you can maybe move, maybe you can't do everything, but you'll start to regain it, okay? So that's what happened. So why 85%? Because it's only 15% that is, at the center of where the artery was feeding it. Okay, so that 15% is no, not getting it. But eight, 85% uh, uh, wasn't dead because it had other flow, but it just wasn't enough. So anyway, if you've got that situation and answering to your question, can necrotic tissue be restored and nerves restored if it is mild ischemic tissue? I'm not sure what you mean by mild, but if it's ischemic at all, and it, in other words, if, it, if it's... Yeah, we, if the blood supply is cut off and the tissue is actually necrotic, no, it can't be restored because it's dead. Once it's dead, it starts to the the it changes. It's no longer um, um, the the the, the structures no longer are um, functional. They don't function. All the little organelles in the cells just don't function if you have dead tissue, and that's what happens. And that's where microorganisms take over and they start to um, eat it. Yeah. So now, so what, to answer your question, I really, um, um, uh, shoebox, I guess, um, keep in mind that if it's, you've got to, I'm not sure what you're talking about, whether it's heart, brain, or could be kidney, could be small bowel, whatever, but you got to just have to make sure that, uh, if it's truly necrotic, if it's dead, dead it means dead, you can't bring it back. 
But if it's just stun, in other words, it's not getting enough, then you can restore it. Yes. What about mistletoe? Use mistletoe, get a hardening at the injection site and gets very itchy. Is this okay? Well, that's exactly what you want. Mistletoe has been used for years and uh, decades, multiple decades. Um, Rudolf Steiner talked about it. It's uh, just a, an amazing way to enhance the immune system. And one of the things you want to do with cancer is enhance the immune system. So if you think about the program that we have, um, it's got three aspects to it. Number one, we change your internal biochemistry so you stop making cancer. Number two, we uh, target and eliminate the cancer that is there with metabolic therapies. In other words, therapies that are not toxic, that don't kill, that challenge the cancer based on the cancer cells limitations. And then number three, um, wake up the immune system. So that's, you know, those are the three aspects of of dealing with cancer. So you've got to wake up the immune system. Mistletoe is a great way of doing that. It's a fantastic way of doing it. And one of the ways you know you're getting a good response is when you get that hardening uh, around there so that you'll get that. And, um, and, and that me and that's similar, that hardening that, 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 that like you get a circle of where you've injected it. Okay. And that hardening is, ah, here we go. Are there? Yeah. That hardening is uh, very much, um, uh, like if has anyone ever had a TB test, right? You go get a TB test. They used to do it when I was in school. You get they give you a thing and you, they tell you to come back in two days or three days. Well, why? Because it's called a, de- a delayed reaction, right? It's a delayed reaction. In other words, uh, it's not an immediate immune response. But if you've already had um, been exposed to TB and you get an injection with that uh, the TB test. It'll take 48 hours, 72 hours for all of your immune cells to get there and start producing this thing. Okay, so anyway, so those the, that hardening that you get from the mistletoe is immunity. So yeah, it's 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 it's, it's a good sign. Okay, how to avoid dementia, which runs in my family. Thank you. No, it doesn't run in your family. Don't, don't ever think that. The only thing that runs in families, I mean, there are twins. Twins have. A lot of similar genetic, uh, but even even twins. When we do, when we look at the the genome, the g- genetic expression of twins after twenty years, thirty years, forty years, very different depending on their environment. Very different, and that's what and that's what's called the epigenetic influence. Epi meaning around. Okay, in other words, the environment's influence on gene expression. We're not talking about changing genes because you're not going to change your DNA unless you get a mRNA injection. Then you'll change your DNA. But we're not talking about that. All right. Um, But now, and also there's no gene. So you said that gene, it runs in your family. Dementia runs in your family. It's not, it, it can't, it doesn't run in the family. So it's it's eating habits, it's uh, social interacting habits, it's those sorts of habits. We grow up, and what, what what do we what do we carry with us when we leave the house? Eventually, yeah, you may kind of look like your father or walk like your father or something like that, but that's about it. it it's not it's not uh, nothing as ex- uh, um, as as, as uh, extreme as dementia or or cancer or things like that. Okay, as I've said before, and I'll just, I'll just remind you all, there are certain, there's less than 5% of all cancers, you know, are, have a genetic component. And there are some that are very real, all right? But when people have this genetic component with cancer, you know it. You know it because your father, your uncle, your, every, everybody had the same kind of cancer. You can't, it's not like, oh, your mother had breast, oh, my mother had breast cancer, my father had pancreatic cancer, and my uncle had uh, prostate cancer, so cancer runs my family. No, 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 no. So, so the kinds of, uh, I mean, it could be if you had BRCA. But again, BRCA is, BRCA is a different story. We've talked about that. I will do a specific video for when we, when we start our, uh, our membership thing, I'm going to do a specific video on, uh, on, uh, on, uh, the genetics of cancer because it's really uh, 
I think it's very confusing. But for the most part, let me just say 95% of people with cancer have, don't have no genetic component at all. All right? So, yeah, keep that in mind. But so now with dementia. Dementia, now, what dementia basically is, is when there is ischemia. We talked about ischemia. Decreased blood flow, therefore decreased oxygen, therefore decreased function. Okay, when that's happening slowly over time, to the arteries that feed the brain, then the brain stops working as efficiently. We also know when we look at brain, um, you know, the brain is nerve, is nerves, right? It's just all nerves. And uh, the 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 speed at which nerves fire changes. It slows down as you get older. Why? Is it because you're old? No. It's because you have accumulated toxins. Let's, and let's, let's actually talk about that for a moment. It's a really important thing. What is getting old? What is getting old? Getting, well, getting old is, um, you, know, I'm not, you know, I'm not sure what a lot of people think it is. But basically, it's the accumulation of toxins. If you did not accumulate toxins, if you did not accumulate toxins, we don't know how long you'd live. And let me give you an example. There was a doctor in uh, 1915, uh, pretty pretty smart guy. I think he got the Nobel Prize in Physiology. Um, he was a PhD, not an MD. Uh, and he worked with chicken hearts. He took chicken hearts, and he, and I don't know if you've ever worked in a, if you've ever, if you've ever taken a biology course, but you can take a piece, you can take a heart and it's beating, right? And you cut it in half, both sides are beating. You can cut those in half, all four are beating. You cut, and anyway, they're all beating because. But heart muscle myocardium, as opposed to um, skeletal muscle, um, has an intrinsic mechanism to beat. It just beats automatically because the calcium, the way the flow of the calcium goes in, automatically goes in. So it's got its own intrinsic. Whereas here, I have to actually move it to cause the calcium to go in to cause the contraction of the muscle. So it's skeletal muscle. Very, very different. So myocardium, heart muscle, versus um, uh, versus skeletal muscle. So, um, but with brain, with so so with nerve tissue, as you decrease the amount the amount of blood flow due to accumulation of toxins. So as as the toxins accumulate, the organs and glands are now obviously slowed down. They can't just like your toilet gets plugged up, just like your garbage, your your sink gets plugged up. It slows you down, okay. And that's what happens with and that's what happens with aging. Our ability to excrete decreases, and when that ability to excrete to get rid of not only not only the toxins that we ingest and we breathe in and that are coming through our skin and all that stuff, not only those toxins, but by um, uh, wastes, biochem bio biochemical wastes that accumulate in the, in the body throughout the day, okay? Um, um, anyway, so they, 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 they accumulate and they slow things down. And when things get slowed down, uh, so, so it's interesting, even I think the, the, the decrease in nerve firing in the brain to go from being really astute and sharp and a good learner down to being kind of a slow learner is, a, is like milliseconds. So it's not a lot. It's not a lot. So when you lose a whole, let's say a half a second or almost a second, you are what they call demented. Uh, it's just that it's not moving fast enough. So, but it's not, but, but anyway, um, who, in your family, please keep this in mind, um, Joni, just keep this in mind. And everybody keep this in mind. Don't get so toxic. Don't eat as much as you would, uh, if you, if you eat a lot. Don't eat frequently, eat once a day, maybe twice a day. Don't eat a lot. Allow you, because when you're not eating, your body's cleaning. Okay, when you're eating, your body can't clean because it's busy assimilating food. Very simple, not complex. Don't have to go to medical school. You don't have to go to 
college or anything. You just have to be like a, a, awake, okay, to understand this. All right, so, um, so the less you eat, the more you clean, and your body gets rid of toxic wastes. Or, yeah. um, and then um, less frequent, etc. All right, and then what else? What are the other ways of that we get rid of waste or that we deal with waste when we sleep? When we sleep, we turn on mechanisms. Uh, there's a um, there's a me mechanism called an autophagy, also called autophagy, uh, which is the cell the body starts cleaning itself. Okay, so if it's not working, it's cleaning. It's you know, but it's never stopping. Okay, so the more you're engaging your body is like for example. Uh, uh, when you're like, if you're exercising, your muscles are accumulating waste. They're they're accumulating lots of waste from the from the metabolic movement, right? And then they get sore, and then you stop when you rest, and you rest, and then they'll clean out the waste. If you never stop, they would just you know they wouldn't work. Um, anyway, so sleep's very important. Um, and then of course all the major organs of elimination are important. So anyway, if you think that uh, uh, something runs in your family, it doesn't. Just change your diet. Don't eat what they eat. Don't eat as much. And when you say we don't eat, eat, eat real food. Eat human food. And I'd like to talk about human food in a minute because I remember um, one of the questions can come up with that. But anyway, so yeah, let me fix this here. Yeah, okay. I hope the people on Facebook realize that uh, there are other platforms and just jump on to, because I don't see anything moving with Instagram. So I guess all those people this week must think that um, I'm not around. What a bummer. I really hate to disappoint people. Um, so, um, anyway. It doesn't run in your family. Dementia doesn't run in your family, okay? Diet, lifestyle runs in your family, okay? Okay, so now, opinion about one cup of organic coffee a day. Or, you know, coffee's, you know, I, I think I mentioned this before, and I have several times now. There was a, an amazing study, like 600, 800,000 people. They looked at over, a, a, what was it, 10 years? Quite a long time. And that whether or not they drank coffee and, or they did not drink coffee, and they didn't even distinguish whether or not these people put sugar and milk in their coffee or not. They just, they drank coffee, they didn't drink coffee. It just turned out that all causes of death, all causes of mortality were higher in those that didn't drink coffee. Now, I don't know why, but that's just the way it is. And when you're talking about a study that has 600,000 people, 700,000 or 500,000 people, whatever it is, that you got to like say, okay, there's got to be some truth to that, right? So... Who knows? Who knows? But anyway, the point is this, is that, uh, I mean, we all know green tea is good for you. Green tea's got caffeine. So it's not, you know, so it's not that the caffeine, anything in excess is not going to be good. All right. But if, a, uh, so one, I'm, I'm one cup of organic coffee is going to be fine, especially black. Yeah. All right. So, um, How to raise immunity with food. How to raise immunity with food. Well, one thing is we all we all really know, right? That um, that uh, our gut microbiome is really um, uh, okay, okay, okay. Um, Our gut microbiome is very, very important for it, for many things. But one of the most important things that our that our that our healthy bacteria in our gut do is is support immunity, give us immunity, right? In fact, without 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 a healthy gut uh, bacteria, we would not have an immunity at all, right? We'd be really, really sick. I mean, we just wouldn't live. Okay, very, very important. Um, so, probiotics and prebiotics. What are prebiotics? The food the bacteria eat. So if you're eating food, which is a lot, what are prebiotics? Basically, simple, plants, fiber. 
both soluble and insoluble fiber, okay? Basically, but both of them are in, un, indigestible because we don't have the enzymes. But the microorganisms have the enzymes. And when they break it down, they break it down into short-chain fatty acids, which are good and healthy and get released into our body and are really, really good, okay? And they, many, many, many things. We need to whole, do a whole thing on, uh, or maybe even, yeah, it's going to be at least, an, at least an hour, two hour thing just on the gut on the gut microbiome, but that's one thing to do. And then the other one is, of course, if he is eating, um, you know, the, the brassica vegetables, the va brassica, that's going to help tremendously. And the garlic and onions tremendously for immunity, okay? Um, so it, there are s foods specifically for that. Um, now, let me, let me go, where was that here? Yeah. Okay, so this question here was, uh, okay, this, I guess this was, uh, okay, on, on, on uh, raw vegan food. Is a raw vegan food better than a cooked food diet? All right, so anyway, it's very interesting. So, no, I think it's Facebook that isn't working. I can't see you there, but I can see you. No, I know Facebook. I can't get on Facebook. Because it's telling me that I have to, I'm going to be permanently deleted, report a problem. Yeah, my problem is fa you, Facebook. Um, can't start live broadcast. You're restricted. Switch back to your primary profile to complete authorization under settings, account settings, identity, confirmation. What? Yeah, okay. Yeah, all right. So, I mean, what can I say? What can I say? I don't know how to do that. I don't even think I ever want to know how to do that stuff. So, anyway, I wish if you guys have, you know, you don't all know each other, but it's just a bummer that I uh, can't get on there. We got to change. We got to get away from Facebook, okay? Look, Mark... Zuckerberg, um, I don't know if he's alive anymore. I don't know the, the guy that I see around who pretends to look like him. Eh, who knows if that's him? Um, or I don't know what that is. Um, anyway. Um, so, but, but, okay, so let me, let me just talk about this. There was a question, it was, is real, raw food better than cooked food? Well, first of all, that's a crazy question, really, right? Really, I mean, think about it. Just, just think about it. Just think about it. We're, the, the earth produces up animals, plants. Well, God helped, but I mean, you know, God put in the spirit, but I mean, the, the, the physical matter comes from, 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 uh, from, from nature, okay? So now each organism that is, that is living in a particular ecosystem, whether it's a jungle, whether it's a pond, whatever it is, uh, has all of the nutrients it needs to survive. So the world, the, the earth, would not have an organism that it wasn't supporting. Otherwise, the organism couldn't exist. And the earth doesn't produce ovens or, or, or microwaves. I mean, this is a question that is really a, a, a question that would come from those of us, you know, I'm not separating myself from anybody, that were, you know, born in the 20th and 21st centuries, right? We're completely disconnected from nature we would even think such a question but anyway so they do studies on it and here's what they found through here there was a, there was this interesting study um a recent study analyzed 240 samples from 20 commercially prepared raw meat for dog because they did this for for dogs and i'll tell you about humans in a minute they looked at raw meat for dogs and cats and what they tested was the different kinds of bacteria that were in them. Three, three samples were collected from each product at each sampling point and were evaluated by culture for E. coli, Salmonella, Campylobacter, you know, all this stuff. But that's absurd because if you have to understand something, we have in our stomach, we produce a lot of acid, and acid kills many bacteria, many microorganisms, okay? Now, 
it used to be thought that the gastric stomach, pH, acidity, was only there for digesting protein, because it's very helpful, very necessary for digesting protein, okay, which would be animal flesh. Um, but there's protein in, uh, uh, in plants too. Just ask, go ask any elephant that you meet or any horse. Um, ask, them, ask them where they got their protein. You might find out that they got it from the same place the lion did, but they got it directly. The lion had to get a middleman. Um, but anyway, so, uh, but it turns out that the, the pH of our stomach actually as, a, acts, performs, uh, has the purpose of, of being an ecological filter. It, it, it filters certain, uh, microorganisms from getting into us. So it's very, very important. So why does the, why do humans have a gastric pH of 1.5 to 2, which is the same as, as, uh, as animals who eat, uh, um, uh, what, what is called carrion. Everyone familiar with the word carrion? Carrion is decayed flesh. Okay, so humans have a pH that is equal to that. So when we look at the pH of different, of the stomach of different animals, and we look, for example, we look at herbivores, which are like cows and horses. Hmm? Uh, they get high pH. In other words, low stomach acidity. And then, and then you get down to dogs and cats and they have more. And then you get down to the, uh, the, to the creatures that eat dead uh, corpses. I mean, the, you know, decaying corpses. And they have the most acidity because there's a lot of different microorganisms in decaying flesh. Okay. So, um, anyway, so it turns out that um, what we're seeing now, and what, what I what I think, and also I found some studies to 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 back it up, that uh, one of the reasons why we're all getting a lot, there's a lot of people getting sick, is that there are so many people on um, proton pump inhibitors and other kinds of things because we're being told we have too much acid, we have acid reflux and stuff. We do we do have acid reflux, but we have acid reflux not because we're making too much acid, right? Because most people are eating food that would actually require lots of acid, such as eating animals, dead animals. So you're going to need even more acid. But it's because of we're overeating and we're eating, we're overeating in volume, we're overeating in frequency, and we, that puts pressure on the lower part of our esophagus, which opens up the esophagus, and then you get reflux. And that's what, that's what happens. So yeah, that, that that's definitely... Um, so anyway, so humans produce, yeah, so here in this study here, the, the conclusion of this study, study is that uh, humans have adjusted to the environment as um, They're not, they're, okay. so we're, we've, got, we've got more acid than omnivores like, um, like pigs, rats, bears, right? These are omnivores. Um, dogs, dogs are more like uh, scavengers, a little bit different than omnivores, yeah. Um, but anyway, but most of it is for to keep our to keep a healthy microbiome. Okay, that's yeah. Now, yeah, there's the, like if in other words, this this the, just to let you know, the study was 2015. It was called the evolution of stomach acidity and its relevance to the human microbiome. Very very important. Okay, very very important. So somebody here is saying they're fruit. Now, uh, fruit. When we talk about fruit, um, we have to understand that fruit is easily digested. Um, it's digested quickly in the uh, upper, in the small intestines. And this is why monkey, um, not just monkey, let's talk about the apes, um, chimpanzees and orangutans who have long fingers and very short thumbs and are swinging through the trees and are able to grab the fruit and they have more energy than the gorilla who's sitting on the ground and just uh, kind of, and, and take, now the gorilla's got a longer thumb relative to its fingers so that it has more dexterity. So in fact, the gorilla is more like us. So we're kind of a hybrid between, if we were to, if we were to think that humans are primates, which we really are not primates, although they're the closest to us, um, they all have 48 chromosomes. We have 46. And uh, that's a big deal. Big deal. Think about it. Um, but for right now, I'm talking about the gorilla uh, 
and the human, and, and then and then and then the chimps and the orangutans. Okay, so now also the relationship between the small intestines and the large intestines. Okay, um, in all apes, whether or not they're the chimps and the orangutans that swing and eat lots of fruit, versus the gorilla who just sits around and eats a lot of greens all day long. They both groups have a larger small a large a larger large intestines relative to their small intestines. In other words, their colon is larger than their small intestines. Okay, very, very interesting. Very interesting. Okay, but it's the small intestine. So we're kind of in the middle, kind of in the middle. So, but who has a longer small intestine than a lot than, than large intestine? The, the herbivores, like the cows and the horses, right? Because they are what they call foregut, uh, upper, gut fermenters, right? So you know cows and all that will have several stomachs and they're fermenting all there. Whereas hind gut fermenters like gorillas that sit around and that's why they have a lot of gas, but they're sitting around, they're fermenting in their colons. Well, we're kind of, uh, we still, uh, we're, we're more like herbivores in that regard. Uh, however, we do have a cecum, we do have all that stuff. So we're like this really interesting thing. But we're definitely not designed to eat animal flesh, regardless of how you look at it. We're not designed. Can you live on animal flesh? But my granddaddy ate. Yeah, sure. You can eat. You can get away with it. You can, you can live on alcohol. You can get away with uh, uh, heroin. Get away with cigarettes. Not everybody that smokes cigarettes gets lung cancer. I mean, so yeah. If you're doing well, living li a life that's antagonistic to your nature, wow, then uh, that's a testament to God. What a fantastic job, right? Look at the adaptability of us. And that's what we, you know, we adapt. So anyway, um, uh, Anyway, so it, it just going back to this one thing, in large part because the acidic human stomach prevents frequent colonization of the gut by larger numbers of foodborne microbes, regardless of whether they are beneficial or pathogenic. Anyway, all right, so. But anyway, so is it better? Now, the study that was done by, by uh, and now I got to, you should all go look this up. It's called the Pottinger study. Um, um, Dr. Pottinger was in the 30s and 40s. You've got to look him up. You've got to see what he did. He did 10 years. Uh, had 900 cats, uh, half half ate uh, raw meat, raw milk. The other ones ate cooked meat, cooked milk, same meat, same milk. And the the, the differences would blow you away. I mean, cancer, stroke, heart attack, depression, anxiety, um, arthritis, uh, low birth weight infants, etc. All just from cooking. And the cooking, they did not use grilling and frying and any of that. So they just steamed or boiled. All right, and that's the only difference. Otherwise, the food was the same, and it there was dramatic differences. Okay, now when we look at humans, there is a guy named Dr. Luigi Fontana. You may know of him, MD, PhD. He was at um, Washington University in St. Louis. I think he's now down in some other country, like Australia or something. I forget where he is. Um, but anyway, he does a lot of research on that. And he looked at the difference between, and I've mentioned this before, between uh, people that have eaten uncooked food versus people that eat cooked food. And all the parameters are better, are healthier in the uncooked, including even though the bones were thinner, they were stronger. They had more tensile strength. Okay. And um, uh, the ones that ate the uncooked food, uh, these are humans, they ate the uncooked food, were uh, had... Um, um, CRPs, which is a CRP, C-reactive protein, is a um, is a biomarker for uh, b total body inflammation uh, that were undetectable. Undetectable I means they did weren't ha they didn't have full body inflammation, whereas all the other uh, the, the the cooked food eaters did. So in terms of inflammation, and if we think of inflammation as the underlying physiological processes that underlie what we call chronic conditions, that's a big deal. Big deal. Big deal. Anyway, so we won't go into this question anymore because we've answered it a lot. Now, another question. 
Only option, chemo radiation. I passed. Okay, I, okay. Clinical trial, doc wants to put me on Zometa. Thoughts on this drug for stage four prostate metastatic cancer. Okay, so stage four prostate metastatic cancer. Stage four again, so, and by the way, it's not just prostate cancer, it's breast cancer. It's, it's lung cancer. It's called it's, it, any of the cancer that can go to the bone is going to be is good. Would 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 uh, um, bring the uh, idea of using Zometa to the oncologist. Okay, because that's what it's for. Um, but as I said, pro prostate cancer and, and breast cancer are, are like the two top cancers that that go to the bone, <clears throat> and they use Zometa a lot. Now Zometa is kind of the strongest one of the, what are called biphosphonates. And what biphosphonates do is they block uh, osteoclastic activity. What the heck is that? Osteoclastic activity are um, cells in the bones that start to break down, break down the bone to prepare for remodeling for growth. Because remember the bone, bones like all tissues in the body are continually breaking down old cells and making new ones. And that's what it is. You know, we are a dynamic process. Being alive is to be dynamic, right? 37 million new cells every second. Me, you, everybody, yeah. Okay, so, um, but and that includes bones. So it's not like you're, you, you, you got the same bone you had last week. You don't, okay. So, same osteoclasts. So if you, can if you can block that, you're gonna block the ability of the cancer cell to get in there because in order for the cancer cell to go in and set up a metastasis in a bone, it's gotta have a spot, it's gotta have a place. And if you're not gonna break it down with the osteoclast, it's not gonna happen. So that's, that's what happens pretty good. All right, so now, about 20 years ago, just about 20 years ago, I was, I didn't like the idea of biphosphonates because they cause stuff like osteonecrosis of the jaw. You know what that is? That means basically your jaw gets, the bone gets rotten and, and dies, necrosis. Osteo is bone, necrosis is death, bone death of the jaw. Why? Because the bone, it's a slow, the turnover is slower. So that if you're blocking the osteoclast, it gets even, it can be a problem. So we saw that. We also saw atrial fibrillation, which is an irregular heart rate and uh, all kinds of stuff from it. So um, I didn't really like it that much. And then I, I, I found this Dr. Singh, S-I-N-G-H, Canadian physician, obviously from India, uh, Indian origin. Um, and he was using doxycycline. Now doxycycline is a antibiotic. It's used for you know acne and other things like that. Um, but, it also blocks osteo osteoclastic activity, which is why you're not supposed to give it to pregnant women, um, because if it'll, it, what'll happen is it'll get into the fetus, and when the fetus starts to grow and it, it starts to develop teeth because of the um, uh, osteoclastic activity, uh, it'll actually the child will be born with lines in their teeth. I don't know if you've ever seen anybody. I, don't, I haven't seen them in many many years, but there used to be. Children, people that had like yellow lines across their teeth going this way. But anyway, uh, but that that which is called which is one of the side effects of this particular antibiotic is turns out to be um, beneficial in this case. So he was using that in those days, and I looked at that and I thought that was cool. I looked at the studies. He had done a few. He was the only guy doing it back in those days. Now it's it's become quite known. But what else did we find about it? What else did we find about? It? Now we found out that. Um, um, and, and, and okay, so so there, so there was a study where, where they looked at um, uh, the doxycycline versus the biphosphonates, such as Zometa, um, and um, they found out that uh, you actually got um, no. Some studies show that you got an increased benefit if you combine them, and some showed that you got all you needed from the doxycycline alone. Now, but the doxycycline also prevents other things. It also blocks HER2, you know, if you've got HER2. So it's also good for HER2. It also blocks um, uh, cancer stem cells, right? Just like ivermectin blocks cancer stem cells. Curcumin blocks cancer stem cells. Vitamin C blocks cancer stem cells. So so is doxycycline, which is why doxycycline is one of the drugs that's in the... What are the, the four drugs that are in that? What do they call it? The care... 
oncology group, whatever it is, they have four like, yeah, um, drugs. Uh, anyway. Um, so, so here, you know, here was a study that published in what, 2016, doxycycline inhibits cancer stem cell phenotype and epithelial to mesenchymal transition in breast cancer. Okay, ep ep epithelial to mesenchymal transition is what has to happen in order for metastasis to occur. Okay, well, that means that the epithelial is a mature cell and for it to become a, it can turn into a cancer cell, uh, can turn into a stem cell, which is mesenchymal. So epithelial to mesenchymal transition is what happens and then it can invade and become. So it prevents that as well. Uh, it prevents lots of stuff. So doxycycline, I think, is a better choice. And it's oral. It's 100 milligrams twice a day. You can take it like that. And it's going to help in many, many different ways. I would think that. So I don't know um, what your situation is. But you've got if you've got stage 4, I don't know. It's probably because it's in the bone. But, you know, go to drlody.com. Make an appointment. Let's have a talk. And, uh, you know, I, you can't take this as being how you should, being all that you need to know to deal with something that is as serious as a stage 4 cancer. Uh, so, what else are we doing with him? Where were we here? Let's look at another. Um, we're really going to have to start. I, I just actually hired somebody to uh, go through these live streams and timestamp them and all that sort of thing so I can start posting stuff like that because it, it you know there's I, I a lot of times I answer questions and then they're asked again the next week and it's just because people thought you might have just joined and you don't know that uh, it's been answered so if we could if there was a place to go on the website that could show you oh here's this question and here's all the different times he's answered it so that's what I'm going to do so anyway because uh, the question here is uh Natural alternatives to estrogen blockers. Yeah, right? We talked about that. Um, natural alternatives to estrogen blockers are um, uh, all of the soy products, flaxseed products, okay? So those are easy to eat. Miso, tempeh, tofu, um, there's even uh, fermented tofu, uh, yogurts, uh, natto. There's uh, all kinds of, of those, as well as the flax seeds. So they remember they are they not they're mildly bind to the alpha, which means they get on there and they don't do much. And the alpha receptors of estrogen are the ones that cause the problems. So if you mildly get on there and you don't do much, you're not gonna that's gonna block the estrone and estradiol from getting on there and causing a major problem. So in that way, it blocks it. Number two, it binds really strongly to the estrogen receptor beta, which shrinks tumors. So the net effect is shrinking, okay? Really good stuff, very important. Uh, whether you have those cancers or not, but if you have those cancers, it's really good, important. So I would definitely... You so and soy's also got all the all the amino acids you need. It's just it's crazy, 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 crazy. Um, very, very important. Um, would you please upload your Insta lives on Spotify? That's a good idea. I, I mean, because I don't. I'll, I'll tell them. You know, I'll tell them. Thank you, Jody. That's great. DCIS, DCIS stage zero, any advice? Yeah, my advice is stay away from hospitals, stay away from doctors, stay away from hospitals, stay away from doctors, and just turn your life around. Live 100% healthy. Learn how to turn this off, okay? Learn how to be quiet. Learn how to uh, listen. It's called psychoneuroimmunology. I think we've mentioned it before. Um, it's called meditation. Meditation, again, is learning how to shut up. Um, and um, um, 
the studies uh, show that natural killer cells increase, all kinds of stuff, when you can turn this off. Because when the mind is turned on, 80% of the mind's thoughts are usually negative, and that negativity causes the immune system to go down. Okay, so you want to control that. But, it's, but DCA has a, a ductal carcinoma in situ basically is not cancer. And it, stage zero, I mean, it, okay. So what you got to do, it just means that you're starting to get some... Um, problems in the uh, in, in in that area in the breast um and it may be in other areas in the body that just haven't been examined but that's uh, that's okay because remember it's cancer systemic it's not a localized phenomenon it's systemic um so I actually have a course on the drlody.com, which is uh, Stop Making Cancers, like an eight-hour course. I'm going to make new ones, too, make other ones, because uh, I want to, um, um, you know, I want to, I just want to take these things further for people that have already watched that and gone through that, and how do you go to the next step? Um, just having a little ginger, and I forget what this is, great, great tea. Would you recommend ionic foot bath detox? No. I, I, I'm, you know, I'm surprised that they still do that because I, I, I found out I used to have one in my office way back when, 2002. And uh, so I, you know, how all that stuff comes out. You put you put your feet in these ionic baths, these ionic baths. They turn on, and all this junk comes out, and you go, "Oh my God, that's fantastic! I got rid of all these toxins." Well, I noticed by accident. We turned it on and then the person, instead of sitting down and putting their feet in the bath, had to go to the bathroom and it was in there for quite a while. It came back and it was all, it looked as the same thing. It turned all those colors and bubbled and foamed without anybody. So I realized that that was a reaction to, because the what they do with those ionic things, they put some sort of salt in there and I don't remember the details. But yeah, and that also makes sense. You're not going to pull out major toxins through the skin. It just doesn't happen that way. You know, through sweat, yeah, you get a lot of you get a lot of stuff out, but not major that not that much. So a lot of that is just not necessary. And so, and someone's making money, you could spend your money in other ways better. You'd be better off to go for a good run. You'd be better off to go for a good bike ride. You'd be better off to do you know, exercise than to do this ionic spot. Um, this ionic. Okay, so now. Um, Let's go here. Uh, okay, so I get painful cramps in both feet and legs at night. Would magnesium help? Absolutely. Absolutely. And you know, you guys, you know, what's really cool is when I see a lot of you answer each other, you, you you know it's almost almost like I'm superfluous because you guys really know all the answers to this. Somebody said, uh, "Yeah, yeah, it's over 300 enzyme systems and it's all that." Yeah, um, and here and one of the questions here I saw on TikTok was, uh, "Can can we ask for magnesium to be part of our routine blood work?" You can. I mean, you you just tell your doctor you want to have it. Um, cause it's not part of, it's not considered one of the electrolytes, you know, um, for some reason. Um, but it's uh, very, very important and it's overlooked. It's also overlooked when we, when you do, um, cardiac resuscitation, um, um, that's kind of at the, you know, they come in at the end with one of the, at, in, in, in the, uh, in the protocols, they come in finally at the end with some IV magnesium. But um, we put magnesium in all of our IVs. It's very, very important. In fact, magnesium and pot potassium are always working together. And when you think of the, um, uh, the enzyme, ATPase, that makes ATP, which is the source of energy of all cells, right? That enzyme is actually called magnesium potassium ATPase, right? So it requires both of them. So if you're not getting that, and where are you going to get, where are you going to get a magnesium from? Anything that's green has magnesium. So if you're having cramps and all that, start drinking lots of green juices and eat, eat major, major, major salads with all kinds of, you know, kale and 
spinach, broccoli, you know, uh, cabbage, you know, all the stuff. Eat green, 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 green. And you can take some magnesium as well. But we need, there's like, it's almost impossible to, uh, to get, uh, to get too, I mean, you could get too much magnesium, of course, yeah. But, um, like, I, especially IV and stuff like that. The other thing that magnesium does, I mean, one of the things it does is it's part of, it's, it's how our body makes nitric oxide, which keeps our arteries open, which keeps blood flowing, uh, lowers blood pressure. It's really good for that. And then uh, if you take a little extra at night, you'll have a nice bowel movement in the morning. So, yeah, magnesium's always good. Um, now, is it been a... Oh, okay, okay, okay. Well, okay. All right, so so what's my uh, opinion on carrot juice? Uh, carrot juice has got, vit see, vitamin A is essential for immune surveillance, for the immune system to work. Very important, amongst other things. However, the carrot juice, the, the reason you can give carrot juice to a, a little kid, and they can say, wow, that's good, because it's so sweet. It's so sweet. Same with apple juice. So they're really sweet. So yeah, they're good. But um, you can still get lots of vitamin A. And you, you don't need to necessarily get it through carrots. So I wouldn't drink or recommend carrot juice or apple juice um, with cancer. Um, okay, so what is the best thing to do for digestion? I thought the body should be as alkaline as possible. Again, here's another one that we've gone over before, but let me answer this user. Yeah, 200, they have you by numbers. Interesting. Um, the, uh, the pH of the blood has to be alkaline, 7.4. And uh, also your interstitial fluid, that's the fluid that bathes the uh, cells. Okay, that has to be alkaline. But not your colon, not your stomach, not lots of different cells, not 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 the, the most most of the small intestines. They've got to be acidic on the on the acid side. Yeah, six point eight, six point seven, six point nine. Um, the stomach is one point five to two. I mean, we're talking about really really acidic. Yeah, so it's not that the body needs to be alkaline, but the blood does. And you can alkalinize the blood by eating by, by, through minerals. And the minerals you get are from plants because plants pick up the minerals from the soil and then they attach them to amino acids so that when you eat the plant, you'll absorb the minerals much more easily. They're bioavailable, okay? So yeah. Now, the question before someone had was about the gallbladder, a tumor in the gallbladder. Now, I, I, read, I read that, but what I don't know quite what you mean because there is a type of cancer that has to do with the, see, the biliary system that produces bile, which goes into the gallbladder is a part of the function of the liver. The liver does detoxification and it makes bile. Um, and anyway, in so, so the cancer, there is a cancer that's in the bile ducts. And that may be that you may be confused. It's called cholangiocarcinoma. I'm not sure if that's the term. You might've heard that, but it's in there. And that happened. Uh, that's that's a pretty uh, um, serious situation because of its, of its location and in the organ, which organ it's in and all that. But it's still cancer is cancer is cancer is cancer, but it's just that it's in its organ. But you're saying it's in the gallbladder itself, so I don't know what that would be. I mean, the gallbladder itself, we don't usually see it. We can see liver, primary liver cancers. We can see... Uh, cholangiocarcinomas, which are of the biliary system in the liver, the gallbladder itself. So really, uh, I would love to answer you. And so what I, what I think would be really great is uh, call, is if you could go onto my website, drlodia.com, make an appointment. Let's have a talk about this. I, and I'd like to see the, 
the work. I, I mean, I'd like to see the the imaging if you did if they've done C, PET scans or or CT scans and um, you know. And so I just I um, you know even even if you don't have the original scans, if you've got the if you've got the, the interpretation that the radiologist wrote about it, so I can see what is what what where is the cancer and all that sort of thing. However, whatever kind of cancer it is, we still always do the same things. And now the the only time the only things that are different about you individual cancers depends on the location, the anatomy of that particular type of um, in that part of the body. But basically, the fundamental biology of cancer is the same, regardless of where it's uh, starting. All right. So. Uh, Yeah, I can't. I'm sorry. I just can't think of a, a in the gallbladder. So give me, give me a call. Let's let's have a talk about this. How can I if I have no money? Well, if you have no money, for how can you what? Can you get in touch with me? Well, um, you. Um, well, just try to get in touch with me, and then. Uh, the other thing is too is you still have to, uh, but, but you're going to have to do something for your. Is it, I think it was your father. You're going to have to do something for him. But we're going to have to find out. But um, I mean, you're going to have to. You know, you have to change diet, go to sleep early. You got to do all these things. You got to do. Um, probably you need to get you need vitamin C. You need you know B seventeen. Um, you know there are certain things that he's going to need that are going to cost some money. So there's no I don't. You, that it's this is the world we live in. There's like no way to do it. The only other way is if some has zero money is is a water fast, and that's got to be supervised. But you can probably go to a place like True North, which is in California, and there are other places around. I'm sure, and I know there are places in South America where you can go and do complete water water fast, complete water fast, where you, um, um, you know, 41 days, things go away. I've seen it many times. Cancer just goes away with a long water fast. All right, but again, you can, not everybody can do a water fast. So, for example, if somebody's already too thin, she's done all of this. She's done all of this. She did a 41-day water fast. You're not from the USA. Okay, you're from Europe. Okay, but I don't know what to say. I don't know what to say. I don't, Beatrice, I don't know what to say. I don't know how I'm going to help you without having details. And all that. So somehow you got to figure out a way. Now, if you, you say she's done a 41 day water fast and nothing's helped. I don't think so. That's, that's just not possible. Just not possible. 41 days of water fast. But you can't just, you got to be, you know, that you need some some guidance with, okay? So, yeah, very, very important, okay? So what is the best thing to do for digestion? Now, that's a very good question. You know, uh, the best thing to do... Okay, good, good, good. So again, people talk about uh, this. Uh, we're gonna start a, a, a water fasting group. Um, anyway, what's the best thing to do for digestion? Well, really, it's to give the digestive tract a break. To give it a, 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 a the best thing you can do for digestion is not eat. It sounds crazy, but it's just the way it is. So, eat, but not as frequently and not as high volumes. Okay, so eat less. Um, so eat small volumes once or twice a day, okay? And then have a long period, at least 16, 18, 20 hours of no eating so that your digestive system will heal, okay? It's got to heal. The tight junctions between the cells have to heal and they can heal if they're always working and moving and stuff like that, okay? Um... So that is that the other because so 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 by by eating less and then doing a fast fasting helps it heal even longer, 
But when you're not fasting, when you're not fasting, you're putting 18 hours, 20 hours between your last meal of today and your first meal of tomorrow, right? That's very important for healing. Also, having the proper bacteria in there because there we are, are, are microorganisms that actually help, actually help um, repair our, our our gut lining, the cells that line our gut. They actually they're part of they're part of our mechanism. They're part of us. They're they're so they're very important. But to have the right bacteria in your in your uh, in your gut, you have to have been you have to eat human food. You have to eat healthy human food. Okay, not because right, humans will eat anything that you know. Anything a dog will eat, humans will eat. Doesn't mean we're designed for it. Okay? We're not designed for it, it turns out. We're not designed for it at all. But we do it. Just like we're not really designed to smoke. We're not really designed to shoot drugs into our veins. We're not really designed for those things. And we survive. But, yeah. All right. So, Anyway, so for di- for digestion, the thing to do for digestion, what do I do for digestion? Stop eating. Get, have long periods, 16, 18, minimum. Mi- they say 16, but I, you know, I, I say 18. 18 to, you know, to, to me, 22 would be great. And just, you, then for, you eat for two hours. Slowly, eat all you can, you know. And remember something about eating. You do not need to get all the nutrients every day, Right? You know, because you, we do store, we do keep foods, all right? So you could have, um, you could eat really lots of, because you need lots of healthy fats. So chia seeds, uh, porridge and, and flaxseed smoothies, etc., hemp seed smoothies, um, um, you know, made properly and all that. Um, and you could do that four days a week, five days a week, and not eat it a couple of days a week, and, and another two days a week, you know, do something else. You need juicing, but you can't juice all day if you're going to be keeping that period, if you're going to be keeping 18 hours between last and first meal. Um, so it's hard to get all of your food in a four to six hour, I mean, to get all the nutrients you need. But basically, you don't need a lot. You don't need a lot of amino acids, surprisingly, right? You need, um, and the carbs is for energy, basically. Carbs for energy and also some for structure. Carbohydrates, by the way, are part of structure and part of function. Uh, we have we have what are called glycoproteins uh, and all that. So, um, yeah, but it's not it's not really hard to get all that, right? Um, some scientific prof from all of your theory. I'm not sure what that. It's a question. How do I feel about spirulina? Okay, so spirulina, chlorella. Amazing, 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 amazing. Eat it every day that you can. Amazing, amazing. Very, very good stuff. Every you know, fat. It's got the healthy fats, healthy amino acids, uh, uh, other stuff. Very, very important. Okay. Um, um, and remember, eating uncooked food. And, and you know, and I was reading a study earlier. Eating uncooked food. Remember, it allows the. Um, the enzymes that are naturally in the food to help in the digestive process. It's called autodigestion, also called biodegradable. I try with another question, who made kidney stones from sodium ascorbate? Otherwise I cannot. It's okay, Beatrice. I, I, I don't know. I'm not sure what you're asking me, but you know, this is not the way we have a dialogue. We have to, you know, talk and all that sort of thing. But, um, you, and you don't have to, you, no one has to believe me, ever. Okay? Don't ever believe me. If I say something, look it up. Look it up. And go to places like PubMed. Don't use Google Scholar just because you don't want to use Google. But go to PubMed and go to places where you can look for some real research. Okay? No, don't, and, 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 and try to get into the habit of reading the real actual papers, the research, the source documents, instead of people's opinions about them. Okay? It's be- much, much better. Learn how to read them. Um, you know, look at... Yeah, you know, look at... Uh, what do you call it? Um...
you could look at the abstract of a study. You can look at maybe the, um, usually the discussion. They have a discussion section where they talk about things. Um, okay, so Beatrice, I don't know what you need proof on. I, every, there's not, I, I have never said anything that's not backed up by, by, by studies. But this is not the venue for me to go over every detail of the studies. You have to read the studies on yourself. So, but anyway, you don't have to. If you're having problems, with, if anybody's having problems with what I'm saying, go somewhere else. Go listen to something. Yeah. I do this. Why do I do this? Why do I do this? I do this because it needs to be, it needs to get out there. It needs to be said. Uh, I don't hear anyone else saying the kinds of things I say, so I got to I got to say them. I got to get them out there, um, and uh, yeah, I mean it's just uh, it's just the truth. The truth has got to be out there, and I just and I'll ne and I can't believe that no one wants to know. And I'll never believe that no one wants to know. Uh, sodium ascorbate and kidney stones. What? Uh, okay, so we've talked about I can't, but I, I I'm trying to stay with. I'm trying to respect the people that have sent in questions already. Okay, because that's the format of this particular thing. I'm trying to respect that, okay? Um, so anyway, so eating eating uncooked food again is going to help with digestion because it's got its own dig it's got its own enzymes. It's going to help. Uh, it's going to help in the digestive process. It's going to save your pancreas and your uh, lining of your small intestines from having to do so much work. Okay, and we know that. Everybody, please look up Doctor po uh, the Pottinger study. It'll blow your mind. Now there was what was it called? Po po There's a book called Pottinger Prophecy. I think someone wrote uh, they, recently, like a couple years ago, wrote a book based on the Pottinger study. But the fantastic book. Okay, and another great one called Tripping Over the Truth was a great book but 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 the pottinger prophecy read that read about that did nature's okay so all right, all right all right all right so anyway in other words so the other ways that we help digestion is we just uh, and remember whenever we're going to aid in any kind of natural process what we always want to remember is that we want to not in any way detract or change the way nature's doing what it does, but augment, uh, help it. So for example, when you eat and the food goes into your stomach, your pH should be should be low. In other words, remember pH, low pH is high acidity. It's kind of the opposite. It's a negative logarithmic scale. It's ridiculous, but it's the way it is. So anyway, so low, I mean, a pH of one is way more acidic than a pH of two of five, of seven, right? Those are all more alkaline. Anyway, so when you eat, so in other words, and when at the older you get or the sicker you are, the less acid you make. So take, you can get some betaine hydrochloric acid, you can take some, and you know, they make it from molasses. Um, and um, remember, hydro, and, you, and you can't say, well, is it organic? Is hydrochloric acid organic? No, because organic, uh, the real meaning of organic is that it's carbon-based, um, chemistry all right and hydrochloric acid has no carbon it's got hydrogen and chloride so there's no carbon so it's you, you wouldn't say it's organic but what we all mean by organic is not the 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 the, the scientific chemical meaning of it but we mean that were, were there were there no um, poisons added to it pesticides herbicides fungicides yeah, and uh, yeah, so that's the thing. So you make sure that there is, you know, in the production of it. So yeah, so you can take betaine hydrochloric acid. You can take that like 10 minutes before you eat, 15 minutes before you eat, so that your stomach is nice and acidic. Then you eat the food, and then at the end, you take digestive enzymes, the ones I use. And I don't have, know even who owns the company, but it's called Transformation. And there's one in there called Digest. Now, there's all different kinds. I like, the reason I like this company is because they use, they, they do a lot of good research. On, on their products. But there's one called Digestzyme. And the reason I like Digestzyme, 
um, the ZYME digest sign. It's because it's got a lot of cellulase. And cellulase is a uh, is the enzyme that breaks down cellulose. So if you're eating lots of plants, um, you're going to wind up with a lot of you know. So it'll help break it down a little bit, so that when it gets to your colon, uh, it'll be it'll, it'll, there'll be more uh, areas for the uh, bacteria to do their job. Uh, and anyway, you just you'll get a you'll get it's more fit. You get more nutrition out of it. You'll get more benefit from it in many ways. So yeah, that's another other ways you can help do it. If you don't have a gallbladder, then you've got to be careful with the amount of fat you eat and all that. So, because there's one question, is if I don't have the gallbladder, what can I do to process my food? Uh, you can actually get bile salts um, to take. If you're going to eat a big, uh, if you're going to eat a, a, a large um, fatty meal. But you can take small amounts. And you'll know, if you don't have a gallbladder, you'll know when you're not processing fats because you actually your feces will float. If it has fat, it'll float in the toilet. Um, and also, it'll, it'll, have, it'll have very, very foul odor. Right, and, here, and see, and like, like I said, you guys answered the, your questions really nicely. Um, Wow. All right, everyone. What is a good resource for raw food recipes? Actually, uh, an Oasis of Healing, we're, we, our book's finished. So we've got, we're going to have a lot of great recipes. Uh, that book is coming out. Um, it should be ready. I mean, I thought it was ready. So uh, uh, at an Oasis of Healing. But there are some other great ones. Um I mean, go on, just, you know, go online. There's a lot of them and you can, you can even learn how to make raw food uh, on, uh, with YouTube. I'm sure they've got people, you know, how do I make, you know, one of the things you want to learn if you're going to eat raw food is that you want to learn how to make different kinds of salad dressings. So you can eat different, so you can eat salads every day. You want to eat big, wonderful salads. And the big thing about salads is um, you take your enzymes at the end of the meal. Yeah. You take the acid at the beginning and then you eat and then you take the enzymes. Um, so, uh, yeah, because, you know, we're used to eating varieties of food and there are all kinds of flavors. So we'll get, we get bored, you know, uh, us overfed, undernourished people. Um, therefore, uh, so have lots of different salad dressings. Learn how to make healthy different sa salad dressings. You can go online and find that. Um, you can learn how to make amazing things. Raw, raw vegan lasagna. Unbelievable how good it is. You say, what? This is raw? Can't be raw. Tastes too good. Yeah, That's, you want to make it look good. So yeah, this book will be out soon um, on uh, uh, on on just recipes. It's just gonna it's just gonna basically have recipes and there's a little bit. I I read a, um, I, I wrote the preface to it or whatever the to, to, to kind of get you into it. Um, Do you only eat raw food? Do I? No, I used to only, but not not now, not now. Because um, why? Because I'm an addict to cooked food, and like all of us are, um, and uh, it's just not uh, not easy. I think if I was un if I had my choice and I was under the right circumstances, I had someone to help me do that. I would absolutely because you feel so much better. You feel so much better. I you can't even begin to understand how good you feel. When you're eating 100% uncooked food, raw food, yeah, unbelievable. Uh, okay, so let's see some more. Can we avoid recurrent? How do we avoid recurrent cancer caused by radiation treatment? Okay, so can we avoid recurrent cancer caused by radiation treatment from the first cancer? It's a good question. Now, the radiation. Radiation, one of the big problems with radiation is later getting a, a, a leukemia because the radiation can get into your, uh, uh, can get into your uh, bone marrow and it can cause a leukemia. Um, the other thing that radiation can do is it, it just destroys the it, adjacent tissues. So like if you did had it on your breast or you had it in your lung or anything like that, the tissues around it, it can, it can, it can just disturb them and they can become cancerous too. So how do you avoid all this? Well, you avoid all this by eating 
doing the same thing you would do even if you didn't get the radiation. Got to get do enemas and colonics. Keep your colon clean. Uh, make sure that you have good bowel movements every day. Really, really important. Eat again within a six-hour window, four-hour window. That's it. Eat real food. That is food that grows, food that the earth makes. Remember, what the earth makes is real food. Once we get our hands on it, human beings, and we take it into the kitchen, it's now artificial. It's no longer real. Okay? And you don't believe me? Do a blood test. Do a blood test after you eat a cooked meal. And see what happens with your white blood cells. They go up. Why do they go up? Because it's saying, what the heck is this? Yeah. Okay? And the earth didn't make it. The earth makes real stuff. Real simple. Okay? Do you understand? So I'm just saying. I'm just saying. Um, so, yeah. So that's what, so you had radiation treatment. You want to prevent it. So you're going to eat real food. Um, and, and I would take um, some extra vitamin A, D, and C. Yeah. Make sure you're taking it on a daily basis. Yep. I would also be going and getting uh, IV vitamin C at least once a week. Mm-hmm. All right. Um, because we, because the problems from the radiation uh, are the production of free radicals, right? And free radicals can be quenched with vitamin C, but vitamin A, vitamin E. Okay. And then vitamin D, of course, is really good for the immune system. But that's what I'd be doing for that. So you can you can definitely avoid it and staying healthy and doing your your uh, you're doing your fasting four times a year, a good a good uh, week to ten day fast four times a year, very very important. Ah. Uh, okay, so let's see, we got some more questions here. Okay, so here's someone, you know, um, Lenny, you're telling me about your husband. Uh, okay, so your husband has esophageal cancer. He went through a time when he couldn't eat or drink, so he was very dehydrated and starved. Yeah, they put a stent in five weeks ago, and he's regaining, picked up three kilogram. We're adding as much as possible as diet, plant-based. Would it still be good for him to fast? No, it doesn't sound like he, he it sounds like he's fasted enough for a while. Um, yeah. Yeah, so he said, yeah, it sounds like, yeah, he should be eating really healthy. I have, you know, um, again, you know, really healthy whole foods. 50% of the diet needs to be fat, healthy fat, which is chia, porridge, flax seeds, avocado, um, coconut oil, oh, yeah, healthy fats. Fifty um, percent, and then then you don't worry about it. you're eating lots of f- salads with everything in it. You'll get all the amino acids you need. You'll get all the all the carbs you need. You'll you get all that. All right, cool. One hundred sixty-eight, uh, one point six eight meters, and sixty-two kilos. Yeah, so yeah, he needs to you know probably get more. The other thing is make sure the hormones are balanced because you need to have enough testosterone so that you your muscles can get. Um, shape and strength and all that sort of thing and movement he needs to be moving around moving all the moving all the body keeping the heart moving keeping everything moving because remember these are these are kind of like turning on the engine of the metabolism that keeps the body happening right so the muscles are very important i mean yeah 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 yeah. so very very important um if you want some help i'd be uh lenny i'd be really help, ha- happy to guide you and your husband through this um and especially with esophageal cancer, which is pretty, pretty, uh, because of its location. Again, remember, cancer is cancer is cancer is cancer, but the esophagus is really an important, critical kind of place. And it's because of the location, it's very difficult. So he's got a stent. Yeah. So, yeah, let's, I mean, let's talk. I mean, you know, contact me, okay? Um, um, My father, 83, has lower colon cancer diagnosis. He had the first three AstraZeneca injections, but has now stopped. He's being offered an operation. He is accepting raw juices. I make him come off dairy and has lowered his meats, increased supplements. 
Any ideas? Wow. You know, the Stop Making Cancer video series on my website, drlody.com, is going to give you lots of information, really important information. However, um, and then because he had these uh, injections, you got to be careful um, about blood clotting and things like that. So you need someone to manage it. So Lisa, you really, um, you need some help. I mean, I'm happy to help. You just have to get in touch with me. But uh, but based on that, you got to look at, for example, basically those, you got to make sure that his D-dimer is not high because you don't want him to be making blood clots. I would, I always look at the lymphocyte subset to see what the different lymphocytes are doing. You know, the the T cells, the T4 cells, T8, T8 cells, um, and, um, natural killer cells and all, all, you know, so there's a lot of different kinds of cells and that's uh, different kinds of lymphocytes and that's what helps in that. Okay, so. What time is it, you guys? Oh, 10.42. Okay, so yeah, we're getting, we're getting up there. Let's see, let's go with one more question. Wow. So listen, uh, Lorraine, it sounds like you, you know, you, there's a, it's growing and you, your breast, you got to talk. It's, the, there's so many things you can do and that you should do. Okay. Um, well, I just wish I could answer all these questions. I just don't know. Um, Okay, so says, could you please give us the names of doctor affiliations you mentioned before for finding a good doctor? Thank you. Yes. Okay, so I mentioned ACAM, American College for the Advancement of Medicine. Okay, that's very important. Um, they train doctors all, who've already gone to medical school and done the residencies and all that, but they need they, they, that need to learn health, you know, other ways, non-conventional ways. So they do that, and then they'll give you a list of different places. So ACAM, uh, Amer uh, American... Uh, uh, Holistic Medical Association, AHMA. Uh, then there is also the um, uh, Naturopathic Doctors is American College or American something of Naturopathic Medicine. Naturopathic Doctors, a lot of them are very excellent. Um, and There is another organization called Orthomolecular. Orthomolecular mean is kind of what um, has to do with doctors that were trained with uh, in using vitamins and, and supplements and stuff like that. I'm not sure how much they know about other things. A4M, American um, Academy of Anti-Aging Medicine. They have they they have functional medicine courses. There's also one something that I don't. It came about after I was I had learned all this stuff, but it was it's called something something functional medicine. So look up for some training for doctors, American something Academy of Functional Medicine, whatever. The, anyway, functional medicine is the term they use now for doctors who are working with that are not doing conventional. In other words, they're looking at um, uh, we're looking at body function rather than a pharmaceutical interventions, right? Which is kind of what I what I talk about, what I do. So physiology. So that's kind of the term now, functional medicine. So if you want to find a doctor, try to find something that says functional medicine. Yeah. Okay, guys. Every good. So thank you so much. So what you And um, namaste. And uh, Facebook, I'm so sorry. But nothing I can do. See you next week. And I'll have, hopefully, I'll have that working. <laughs>